Hello everyone. Today we'll be solving AQA, GCSE Chemistry, Higher Tier, Chemistry Paper 1. Today we'll be solving Specimen 2018. This is a part 1 of the question paper in which we are going to be solving from question number 1 to question number 5. Question is about halogens and their compounds. Table 1 shows the boiling points and properties of some of the elements in group 7 of the periodic table. We can see the table in which we have the boiling point and color in aqueous solution of fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. We can see that as we go down the group, the color darkens. And also we can see as we go down the group, the boiling point increases. Why does the iodine have higher boiling point than chlorine? Now we know that iodine and chlorine both are molecular. So iodine is a larger molecule, it is larger. Since it is larger, so there will be more attraction between the molecules. So the options are iodine is ionic and chlorine is covalent. Well, both of them are covalent compound. Iodine is less reactive than chlorine. Iodine is less reactive than chlorine, but that doesn't explain why it has a higher boiling point. Covalent bonds between iodine atoms are stronger. When we try to boil something, we do not break the covalent bond between the inter molecule, okay? Between the, uh, between, between the inter, you know, between the atoms, okay? So what do we do? We basically break the intermolecular force. So the forces between iodine molecules are stronger compared to that of chlorine. Predict the boiling point of bromine. So the boiling point of bromine will be lower than that of 184 and higher than that of 35. So it can be somewhere in between. Since they asked us to predict, we can just assume from minus 188 to minus 35, we can see that there is an increase in 150 degrees Celsius. So we can consider similar thing like that. So we can, uh, if we increase in 150 degrees Celsius here, so it will be 120. The boiling point we can say 120 degrees Celsius. Our redox reaction takes place when aqueous chlorine is added to potassium iodide solution. The equation for this reaction is chlorine plus potassium iodide produces iodine plus potassium chloride. What is the color of the final solution in this reaction? Okay, because we are producing iodine and iodine aqueous has a brown color. So the final color of the solution will be brown. What is the ionic equation for the reaction between chlorine with potassium iodide? So when we have to deduce the ionic equation, we can look into the original equation. So here we have chlorine and we have two potassium ion and we have two iodide ion that reacted to produce iodine, two potassium ion and two chloride ion. Now, the spectator ions must be cancelled from both of the sides, which is potassium, which did not change in both of the sides. Chlorine plus 2I minus turning into I2 and 2Cl minus. Or any multiples of that will be correct. Chlorine plus 2I minus producing I2 and 2Cl minus. So this equation, equation number B should be correct. Why does potassium iodide solution conduct electricity? Now, potassium iodide solution is a ionic solution. So ionic solution contains aqueous potassium ions and also contains aqueous iodide ions. And and we know that ions can conduct electricity. Ions can carry electrons, so it can conduct electricity. It contains a metal? No, it contains electrons which can move. No, it doesn't contain electrons, which is, it contains ions which can move. So this should be the correct answer. What are the products of electrolyzing potassium iodide solution? Now, when we have a potassium iodide solution, the ions that are present are potassium ions, iodide ions, and because it's a solution, so we also have H plus ions and OH minus ions. When we are going to do electrolysis of this, between the metals, the potassium and the hydrogen, between these cations, the hydrogen ion has a upper hand. So add to the product at the cathode is always going to be hydrogen compared to that of the potassium. The lower in the reactivity series gets released first. And between the iodide and the hydroxide, we are going to release, definitely we are going to release the iodine, all right? Because it's a potassium iodide solution and the iodide is still present. So we're going to produce iodine. So hydrogen at the cathode and iodine at the anode will be the product. An atom of aluminium has a symbol 27, 13. Give the number of protons, neutrons and electrons in this atom of aluminium. Number of protons. So number of protons is 30. Number of neutrons will be 27 minus 30, which gives us 40. Number of electrons will be equal to the number of protons. So 30. Why is aluminium positioned in group 3 of the periodic table? If we take aluminium, the number of electrons 13 and we break it down in terms of standard electronic configuration then it becomes 283 which means there are three electrons in the outer energy shell so the answer for this one will be there are three electrons in the outer energy shell
In the periodic table, the transition elements and group 1 elements are metals. Some of the properties of two transition elements and two group 1 elements are shown here. So we have table 2. Alright, so we can see the properties. We can see chromium forming multiple oxides, similar with iron. But sodium and cesium, they are group 1 element. They only produce one oxide with one oxidation state. Use your own knowledge and the data in table 2 to compare the chemical and physical properties of transition element and group 1 elements. Guys, this particular question is a very common question during our exam. So we will always come first of all with the physical properties between transition element and group 1 element. So transition elements have high melting point, they have high density, they are strong, they are hard. Whereas group 1 elements have a low melting point, low density, they are soft, all right? So this is the physical properties. And when it comes to chemical properties, we are going to say transition elements are usually less reactive in water, okay? And also we are going to say they can be used as catalyst. Transition element have multiple oxidation state as we can see over here. And we can also say the transition element have colored compounds. Along with that for group 1 we are going to say group 1 elements are very reactive. We know that you know sodium, cesium will have to store it under oil right? It's so reactive and it cannot be used as a catalyst. Any compound that the sodium and cesium forms, group 1 element forms, they are going to be white in color. So they do not have color in their compounds. But as transition element remember they have color in their compounds and only form plus 1 positive ion in the case of group 1 element. Figure 1 shows the outer electron in an atom of the group 1 element potassium and in an atom of group 6 element sulfur. Potassium forms an ionic compound with sulfur. Describe what happens when two atoms of potassium react with one atom of sulfur. Give your answer in terms of electron transfer. Give the formula of the ions formed. Basically to sulfur, only one electron can transfer. That's why two potassiums are needed with each sulfur because sulfur is going to accept two electron each. That being said, all right, once the potassium gives one electron, the potassium becomes positive one charge. And once the sulfur gains two electrons, the sulfur becomes minus two negative charge. The structure of potassium sulfide can be represented using the ball and stick model as shown in figure 2. We can see the sulfide ion represented a little bit bigger than the potassium. We can see in the structure that each sulfur is bonded to the potassiums. The ball and stick model is not a true representation of the structure of potassium sulfide. Give one reason why. Technically, we are supposed to have double the quantity of potassium ions compared to that of the sulfide ions. So the answer should be like this. There are no gaps between the potassium ions and the sulfide ions. Sulfur can also form covalent components. Complete the dot and cross diagram to show the covalent bonding in a molecule of hydrogen sulfide. Show the outer shell electrons only. So we know the sulfur contains six electrons in the outer shell. In this case, let's represent sulfur as a dot and hydrogen as cross. So two crosses from the hydrogen, two dots from the sulfur, and sulfur have total of six electrons in the outer shell. Calculate the relative formula mass MR of aluminium sulfate. Relative atomic mass AR of oxygen is given 16, aluminium 27, and sulfur is 32. To calculate this, we will first of all take into account that there are two aluminium. So 2 times 27 plus there is sulfur which is 32 plus there are 4 oxygen in each sulfate. So 16 times 4. And in aluminium sulfate, there are 3 sulfates. So we're going to multiply the whole thing by 3. So the answer is 342. Covalent compounds such as hydrogen sulfide have low melting points and do not conduct electricity when molten. Draw one line from each property to exclude the explanation of the property. So low melting point. If we look into the compound hydrogen sulfide, it's a covalent compound. Covalent compound and it is molecular. So whenever a covalent compound is simple molecular like this one, it will generally have a low boiling temperature, low melting temperature because they have very weak attraction between the molecules. So low melting point. Electrons are free to move. That's not the answer. There are no charged particles to free to move. Well, that doesn't explain low melting point. Weak intermolecular force of attraction explains melting point. Does not conduct electricity when molten. Electricity is conducted by free electrons or free ions because it is already covalent and covalent compound doesn't have ions so we can only think about electrons you can say there are no charged particles free to move that being said it will be both ions and electrons ionic compounds such as potassium sulfide have high boiling point and conduct electricity when dissolved in water draw one line from each property to the explanation of the property high boiling point we know that ionic compounds have high boiling point because the bonds between the cations and the anions are very very strong so the bonds are strong that will be the answer. Ionic bonds conduct electricity when molten. We know that ionic bonds such as 
For example, in the case of sodium chloride, sodium ions and chloride ions, they are when molten, they are free ions. And we know ions are free to move and they can conduct electricity. We'll say ions are free to move, which means they can conduct electricity. Rock salt is a mixture of sand and salt. Salt dissolves in water, sand does not dissolve in water. Some student prepared separated rock salt. Place the rock salt in the beaker and 100 cm of cold water. Allow the sand to settle to the bottom of the beaker. Carefully pour the salty water into an evaporating dish. Hint the contents of the evaporating dish with the bottom until salt crystals start to form. Suggest one improvement to step to make sure all the salt is dissolved in the water. So the student did not heat the solution. If the student were to heat the solution, then all the salt would dissolve in the water. A added point here will be heat or the student could stire the solution. The student didn't stire the solution either. So we can say heat or stire. Just make sure to write any one. The salty water in step 4 still contained very small grains of sand. Some suggest one improvement to step 4 to remove all the sand. To remove all the sand, filter paper can be used. Because the student is, you know, decanting here, we can see the process of decanting. So filtration would be better to remove small sands. Suggest one safety precaution that the student could take in step 5. We can see in step 5, the contents are being heated. So when we are heating the content, we can use. Because, you know, whenever we are heating a salt solution, it can have a problem of spitting, meaning the salt solution can flicker and the salt solution can enter the eye. So wearing safety goggles. Now the student removed water from the salty water using the apparatus in figure 3. We can see a simple distillation apparatus, all right, where we see that the salty water is heated at the point A and the steam is rising, which does not contain any salt. The salty, uh, the steam is then condensing it and we are receiving the pure water. Just kind of how this technique works by referring to the processes A and B. So at A, we have evaporation and at B, we have condensation. What is the reading on the thermometer during this process? So obviously the reading on the thermometer should be close to 100 degrees Celsius because 100 degrees Celsius is the boiling point of water, 100 degrees Celsius. A student investigated the reactions of copper carbonate and copper oxide with dilute hydrochloric acid. In both reactions, one of the product is copper chloride. Describe how a sample of copper chloride crystal could be made from copper carbonate and dilute hydrochloric acid. To make crystals of copper chloride, first of all, we can add excess amount of copper carbonate to dilute hydrochloric acid. The reason we add excess amount of copper carbonate is because copper carbonate is insoluble in water. Once it reacts with the hydrochloric acid and all the hydrochloric acid has been reacted, the excess copper carbonate will remain in that particular solution as a solid. So we can just simply filter it and we can remove it. Then we will collect that filtrate. We will evaporate some of the water from the filtrate and we will you know, leave it for crystallization. All right, and we'll leave it to cool so that the crystals can form. A student wanted to make 11 gram of copper chloride. The equation of the reaction is copper carbonate reacting with 2 hydrochloric acid, producing copper chloride, water, and carbon dioxide. If we look into the stoichiometry of the equation, it is 1 is to 2 is to 1 is to 1 is to 1. This number represents the mole ratio. Now, all the atomic masses AR has been provided. Calculate the mass of copper carbonate the student should react with dilute hydrochloric acid to make 11 gram of copper chloride. In a question like this, our attempt should be backwards. We need to first find out the MR of copper chloride. Once we find out the MR of copper chloride, we will find out the number of moles of copper chloride. Once we find out the number of moles of copper chloride, then we will do back calculation. Because we are reacting in a ratio where we are producing one mole of copper chloride from one mole of copper carbonate, so we will find out the number of moles of copper carbonate after that, which will be equal to the number of moles of copper chloride. Once we get that information, then we can find out the MR of copper carbonate and then by using that, we will find out the MR of copper carbonate and by using that then we can use the number of moles along with it to find out the mass of copper carbonate that is needed. The percentage yield of copper chloride was 79.1%. Calculate the mass of copper chloride the student actually produced. To find out that what mass of copper chloride the student actually produced, first of all, find out the total mass of the reactor. To find out the total percentage yield, the percentage yield of copper chloride was 79.1%. Calculate the mass of copper chloride the student actually produced. So to find out the mass of copper chloride the student actually produced, we will have to take 79%, 9.1%, 
and then we're just simply going to multiply it with 11 and that gives us 8.70 grams. So the actual mass that the student could produce was 8.70 gram. Look at the equation for the two reactions. Copper carbonate plus hydrochloric acid produces copper chloride and copper oxide with hydrochloric acid also produces copper chloride. The percentage atom economy of the reaction is calculated using the relative formula mass of desired product from the equation divided by sum of the relative atomic sum of the relative formula masses of all reactants from the equation. Now the question says calculate the percentage atomic economy for reaction 2. So to find that out, first of all, let's write reaction 2. So we are trying to find out the percentage atom economy. So we will first of all find out the total mass of reactant. Total mass of reactant. So our reactants are copper oxide and two hydrochloric acid. Copper is, so uh, copper oxide is 79.5. Each hydrochloric acid is 36.5. So two times 36.5. This gives us a total of 152.5. Now, when we find out the percentage atom economy, percentage atom economy, we will divide it by the total mass of the reactants, which is 152.5. And the amount of product is 134.5 into 100 percent so this gives us 88.2 percent the atom economy for the reaction one is 68.45 compare the atom economies of the two reactions for making copper chloride even a reason for the difference so basically atom economy using copper carbonate has lower economy because you know an additional product is made which is carbon dioxide and it is lost which is not desirable that's why it has lower atom economy so guys, that's all for the today's question paper. Thank you for joining the video. Guys, the part 2 series of this particular video will be uploaded next. So keep an eye for that. Thank you for watching the video. See you in the next video.